Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be placing a spotlight on organizations that help make housing accessible to all with special guests, Philip Hecht, President and CEO of Housing Up in Washington, D.C., Maria Devlin, President and CEO of Families in Transition in New Hampshire, and Rob Cramp, Executive Director of Housing for Homeless in Florida. So, uh, Philip, let me just set you up. Uh, we're we're going to start with you, and then we're going to go around the room. There are so many individuals and families in America who don't have a place to call home, with more than half a million people across the United States experiencing homelessness on any given night, according to the National Alliance to End Homelessness. So let's talk about the picture from each of these parts of, uh, of America and, and starting with you, Philip, uh, could you just paint a picture of homelessness in, in our nation's capital in the greater Washington, D.C. area? Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for this opportunity. Uh, the picture in the District of Columbia is actually fairly bright. There is a decrease from 2020 into 2021, about a 20% decrease in the number of homeless individuals. There are now 5,111 as of the early part of 2021. The number of families who are homeless in the district has dropped about 50% between the year 2020 and today. There were more than almost 4,000 families in 2020 who were homeless. and There are now 1,240 families this year. Um, the reason for that, uh, there are many reasons, but the federal government and the district government have taken actions during the pandemic. I'm sure everybody's heard about the moratorium on evictions. That has helped a little bit, uh, but the eviction moratorium is gonna be ending, at least federally, at the end of this month, at the end of July. On a positive note too, the District of Columbia is I think unique in its dedication to provide money for affordable housing. Mayor Muriel Bowser has a goal of 36,000 more units apartment units in the district by 2025, 12,000 of which are meant to be affordable. The district's budget for this year includes $400 million in affordable housing support, and $42 million for vouchers for people who are needing that subsidy. Where, but this is important in the district and probably elsewhere because more than 60% of our low income renters are cost burdened spending more than 30% of their income on their rent. So um, today I can say that trending is in the right direction, but I'm afraid that the uh, moratorium on evictions when it ends will cause an avalanche of new homelessness. And Maria, um, in, in New Hampshire, are you also benefiting from the moratorium on evictions? What is the picture looking uh, like for you, uh, 2021 compared to the recent uh, past years? Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Mark, for having us here. Um, and Philip painted a, a great picture. We are seeing the same types of delay in uh, some homelessness because of the eviction moratorium. Unfortunately, New Hampshire has actually seen a 20% increase in our homeless uh, population. Um, New Hampshire is a small state, so 20% is, is a lot for us. Um, and we're looking at over 4,000 individuals throughout the state of New Hampshire who are, were captured in the point of time count uh, who are homeless. Um, we, we definitely are seeing many more families um, who are homeless. We have a wait list currently for our family shelters of about 37 families. Uh, and the homeless individual population that we have in Manchester, the biggest city in New Hampshire, um, we have a number of individuals who are in camps throughout the city and finding permanent housing for them is certainly a challenge. How, how does it look uh, in, in Florida, Rob? Well, it's hard to sum up the whole state. So I'll, I'll focus on the county that, that we're in. in, in, in the, it, it's small. It's called Brevard. It, it covers the uh, Canaveral area. So it's relatively prosperous, particularly with the growth the resurgence, if you like, of the private space industry. It's about a population of 600,000. Our, our homeless population is about 1,200, and it's kind of holding steady. Um, one big concern, because there are so many people moving in um, to, the, to the county, 
is a lack of affordable housing. There's a group works out at the University of Florida called Schimberg, and every three years or so, they do a, an analysis of the gap between supply and demand for affordable housing. And the, the lack of affordable housing is stunning. Three, uh, in the last three years, people earning under 30% AMI, which is around about 20, 25,000, the, the, the gap between what, what was available and what they need uh, went up by 40%. Um, and people earning more going up to 40% AMI, let's throw out 30,000 as a family. Um, the lack of affordable, the gap between supply and demand has tripled in three years. So clearly, um, it, the problem is not going away. Affordable housing becomes a bigger and bigger issue. Can we talk about this from a uh, income perspective, because so often the response is um, housing uh, issues reduce when government spends more on affordable housing or when there are more affordable housing units uh, built. But it, it, it does seem for as long as I've been alive, we've had a, a really big housing issue. And it seems to expand, particularly in areas where uh, wealth concentrates and poverty also concentrates. Um, what is going on here in terms of our, our housing issue? Uh, could, could we talk a little bit about who is who are the homeless? Are these people who have jobs, who, who are uh, working? Are they people who um, have uh, are unemployed for various reasons, who have certain um, needs that that make them um, susceptible to uh, to being uh, homeless. Uh, Philip, could you just give us a paint a picture of, of who we're talking about when we're talking about people who are homeless? Sure, I think all the factors, Mark, that you mentioned are at play, in, at least in the District of Columbia, in leading to homelessness. I think um, it might be more of an issue here in the district. Uh, we have 700, more, a little bit more than 700,000 uh, residents of the district. It's about 50% black, uh, probably 20% Hispanic. And those populations, perhaps always, but especially today, have been disproportionately affected. Uh, affordable housing is the challenge. Is this, is, is, this about, is this about the alignment of wealth to race in this country? Um, I would say 100%, 1,000%, yes. Uh, but it is exacerbated by the fact that the prices of for housing in the district have gone through the roof. Uh, it, we, we can't expand our borders. We can't annex a suburb. So the district, at least as a polity, is stuck with uh, the size of the district that we have. So we are always going to have, I think, a higher concentration and a greater disparity between the, the haves and the have-nots. But the racial disparity between income and wealth uh, is only getting worse. Uh, but, but all the factors you mentioned, I think, are at play in what is uh, making the homelessness problem continue. I can um, throw in a, a metric to support um, Philip on that. In, in, so in our county, the uh, African-American population is 9% uh, of the county. The homeless population, 40% of it is African-American. And, and Rob, is this also aligned to, to income primarily or are there other factors? No, no, it's mostly income. I think we, we have to talk more about homelessness as a symptom of poverty. Um, you get more poverty, you get homelessness. You know, out of, if you're looking nationally, out of 22 OECD countries, we have the highest percentage of our citizens living below the poverty line, 28,000 family of four. That's 17%. 21% for children. So every one in five children in this country lives in poverty. That drives homelessness. And, and uh, in terms of, Maria, in terms of, of the, the question that, that Rob is begging, this whole idea of, of poverty, is there also an issue with the wealth gap? In other words, the unequal distribution of, of wealth in that it seems that as we concentrate wealth and we, we end up with people who are very, very prosperous, it seems that the price we, we are constantly paying is, are people almost in equal proportion, right? 
who who are thrown into poverty. And as a matter of fact, the it seems that fewer people become very wealthy in proportion to more people are becoming very poor. Yes, I think you, we're seeing that throughout the entire country. Here in New Hampshire, the way that is showing up is um, for someone who's making a minimum wage, in order to have a two-bedroom apartment, they would have to work over 120 hours a week in order to have a two-bedroom apartment. Here in New Hampshire, a two-bedroom is about $1,400, and that outprices even people who are working those minimum wage jobs. Here in New Hampshire, we're not um, we're lower than maybe other parts of the country. So that is a factor. So Mark, when you talk about, you know, are there people who are homeless who are working? The answer is yes. You know, we are working with people who are living in camps or within our adult shelter or in our family shelter, they're working, but they're working very minimal jobs. And the price of uh, an affordable a night, a place to live is just completely outpriced um, for them. Um, and that's, that's a huge issue. And when it comes to development of affordable housing, most developers want to develop condos and homes that are gonna bring in, as we know, people who are gonna pay the highest price. And so it becomes much more difficult to develop affordable housing. And for our population, we are talking the lowest income people who need the housing. It's interesting. We just finished a uh, poll, Maria, where we, we asked, uh, have you or anyone you know benefited from or provided affordable housing services? 56% of the people who responded said that they had. 44% said that they haven't. But we've all actually experienced uh, homelessness, um, if only by walking by somebody who is uh, quite obviously uh, homeless. Um, how do we deal with the issue? It seems that, that we're constantly chasing a solution here for a problem that, that it seems that we're also collaborating as a country on, on making worse. Um, and, and Philip, you, you talked about uh, the district's dedication to, um, through its, its tax policies and its revenue policies, to funding affordable housing units. Is, is the solution to continue to uh, basically um, use tax dollars to create uh, housing units, or are there other more fundamental solutions that we can settle on as a society that will uh, prevent the problem from metastasizing as it has? Uh, I, I think that the short answer is yes. Uh, money is- uh, So it's both. It's, it's availability both. Nice. Of, of money to build more affordable housing is important. I, I would say that the district um, is ahead of most other jurisdictions in the commitment that it has made with 400 million going into what we call the Housing Production Trust Fund to, uh, to enable developers like Housing Up to do more affordable housing. There are uh, certainly other solutions, but as a housing first organization, we believe that housing is a right that everybody has and until people are safely uh, and comfortably housed, the other issues that need to be addressed are likely to fall by the wayside. At least that's what we have found. And, and Maria, how do, how do you see it? Are there, are there approaches that we could take to prevent this, this issue from metastasizing as a society? I'd love to say yes, although I'm not sure we're there yet as a society. Um, you know, what we're seeing in New Hampshire, I think we're all seeing as we talk about the fact that our borders can't get any bigger. You know, New Hampshire is New Hampshire. Each of our towns and cities is its own little boundary. And each town and city has to come up with their own plan on what they want to do to help make their town more affordable for people to live in. Um, I think, you know, we do have a NIMBYism uh, here across the country. People don't want people who are extremely low income living in their neighborhoods. And so there has to be a lot of education on why it's important to have mixed neighborhoods where everyone can thrive and everyone is lifted up. I think too, of course it comes down to money and there's, there's housing money, there's um, lots of government programs currently going on that, that can help organizations like the three of us here today in a number of different ways. But what it really comes down to Mark is the long-term kind of operational costs of those buildings over time. I, you know, I heard Rob say earlier, he, they're expanding by a tremendous amount 
we're a much smaller organization than, than Housing for the Homeless where he is. But the cost of, of owning and operating these buildings, providing the supportive services that these families and individuals need over time is extremely expensive. And that's where the philanthropic part of our work also is critically important. So it does come down to money and the streams of money has to be very wide and um, long-term. We just completed just... a, a uh, poll, Rob, um, in which uh, Maria's point, which, which I'll, uh, I'll shoot over to you, um, is emphasized. Um, uh, 43% of people said, um, when asked, do you believe uh, affordable housing enables individuals and neighborhoods to stabilize and overcome other challenges? 43% said yes, if housing were more affordable and stable, and that alone will make a huge difference. 57% said really so housing needs to come with support. And that kind of emphasizes the, the uh, point that uh, Maria uh, made. Uh, Rob, what, what is your experience in Florida? <laughs> the, yeah, it varies a lot in Florida. So it's hard, you know, it's a very big state. You right. have major homeless problems in, in big cities like um, Orlando um, and uh, Miami, you know, Miami-Dade as well, um, although they're doing a lot to really to do, but it comes back again to affordable housing. Now, that, interesting, your comment though about housing, um, not just affordable housing, but the presence of a house itself. 60% of homeless people uh, nationally suffer from mental health problems or substance abuse problems. And you cannot effectively treat those problems unless they're in stable housing. So that, you know, it's not just a question of housing, it's creating a stable atmosphere that these people can get treatment for. And the problem is, even when they get into the housing, there usually isn't enough money a lot. So even when we're providing this housing, we feel like we're kicking the can down the road because these people are leaving our housing at the end of a program, and they're not much better off than, than when they left. They've stabilized their life, they're able to move on, but they still retain the same mental health problems, the same substance abuse problems that, that kind of contributed to the problem in the first place. Mark, if I could just add to that, um, I think that supportive, supportive housing is where we are. We've always been that way for the last 30 years. We don't just provide an apartment. We provide case management services, resident services, connection to various um, either medical services or mental health services for all of our clients. And, but unless you have that two-step or multi multi-faceted approach, I think you're gonna end up like Rob with, with families that are individuals who do not move forward. So what you, what you all seem to be saying is that um, it's not just, uh, and we, we, we did get a question uh, from Stephanie, isn't land, uh, finding land to build and so on, a barrier or, or acquiring uh, a housing a barrier? What you, what you all seem to be saying is that really it's it's the acquisition of, of uh, housing and being able to provide that, but it's really uh, a baseline required. And, and this is goes to your point, Rob, uh, for also addressing um, other needs. Uh, so so are we under, under investing? You know, if you look at society, um, you could take a Darwinian approach in which you say survival of the fittest, the devil, devil take the hindmost, right? If you can't, if you can't hack it, you'll be left behind, right? Um, you can also create a nanny state. And there seems to be a false choice between those two bookends, those two extremes. But um, I, I think there might be a case to be made that we're not really um, investing a sufficient amount of our very rich resource in ensuring that that so many people are are are, are marginal are not marginalized um, do you all have a have a a view on this because this whole uh, issue of shaping language to prevent solutions basically characterizing things as income re redistribution or or uh, others as being heartless it, it just seems to Miss the point. We don't get to solve anything if we're not talking about it. Uh, Philip, you want to give well, a couple of this? I, I may not subscribe to this, what I'm going to say fully, but I think the economics of providing housing and supportive services is literally cheaper than 
maintaining homelessness or ignoring homelessness like some want to do. The number of hospital visits, the number of emergency uh, medical events that take place when people are on the street or in shelter is far greater and far more expensive to deal with than if they were housed. I'm not saying the issue goes away or is completely solved, but I think that the economics that I've read suggest hospitals are now supporting it um, more than they ever would because there are health connections between being homeless and being sick or homelessness and reporting to the emergency room. So there's, there's that pure economic argument over and above the uh, ethical argument that I would support. Rob, how do you see it? Yes, um, in our county, we did an analysis three years ago, the cost of homelessness, we're a small county with 600,000 population. The cost of homelessness per year was $28 million. And, and 22 million of that was through healthcare, through the hospitals, a lot of emergency right. room. And it, but it's very difficult to get into a, a, a responsible dialogue, if you like, um, with the hospital population because they have their own challenges there. Um, but it's definitely uh, an e economic lead. But you have to get everybody. It's not you're blaming it on the hospital. They they do whatever's necessary to keep people well. Um, and then they have to spend the money. Um, it's getting the, the county commissioners. It's getting the whole government lined up behind the cost. And what can we do to drive it down? I always love a state whose motto is live free or die, uh, Maria. Um, how, do, how do you see it from the uh, from the New Hampshire perspective? Because um, New Hampshireites are notoriously um, uh, 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 stiff back when it comes to, um, to uh, uh, individual liberty um, and, and the whole idea of state intervention. And as you said, every municipality has its own uh, sensibility in New Hampshire. Um, how, how is it actually seen in, in your state, this, this issue of addressing homelessness in a way that, that just makes sense, right? Because New Hampshire rights are also very, very practical folks. We are very practical and being here my entire life, that's completely true. Um, one of the things that I think is really exciting is here in New Hampshire, our governor did create recently a council on housing stability, um, very much along the lines of, as Philip was talking about, um, you know, the government actually making a, a plan and a strategy to determine how we're going to move forward. And a lot of the things we talked about today are in that plan, 13,000 new units in the next a uh, couple of years between now and 2024, I think. Um, and that'll help some, um, but we also see small increments in our uh, population just continuing to increase. And I think, you know, as we talked about that, the, the differences in wages between our highest paid and our lowest paid. Um, in New Hampshire, tourism is our biggest um, money maker. Um, that and state employees um, are our two biggest kind of markets of where people get their income from. And that means a lot of people are making, barely making minimum wage um, and, and that work cycles. And with the pandemic, you, we, you talked about it earlier in regards to COVID and, and where the numbers are, but small states like ours, is gonna have a hard time kind of rebounding. And we know our tourist industry is, has been hit extremely hard. So that's gonna, continue to hurt the people who um, who may be safe right now uh, when the eviction moratorium is on. But as soon as that is lifted, our fear is that we're going to see a greater a rise in homelessness in 2021. So is, is part of the issue that, um, and, and uh, I don't know who uh, mentioned it, but, but you were talking about the working poor as well, is part of the issue uh, trying to provide some supportive services for the 60% who are homelessness, who need additional support, mental health support, addiction recovery, and so on and so forth, is part of the issue also a question of, of, of grappling with what is living wage, you know, as our jobs are being exported to places uh, uh, where the wage is a dollar a day, right? I mean, how do you compete against that, right? How do you make sure that there is uh, dignity and work and that also we are paying for 
the um, for the quality of life of people who labor to make our products, right? As as consumers, um, how do you see this? Because you know, on the one hand, you can end up with with a totally overregulated regimen, right? Where the free market can't actually operate. On the other hand, um, if if you just allow for uh, Darwinian uh, structures, then uh, what what happens is fewer and fewer people prosper, and and uh, and there are masses of people who just don't. Uh, Rob, how do you see this? Well, I think you start, first of all, I think you have to start off with the tax system. You know, we're supposed to have a progressive tax system. We don't. We have a regressive tax system. That's why Warren Buffett says he pays less a percentage of his tax of his income in tax than the secretary does, because our system, unlike most almost all Western countries, our tax system is, is built on deduction. And if you don't earn it, how can you deduct it? So we have to get out of the deduction cycle to enable not people not to just to earn it, but to hold on to it. Now, they pay more of their tax than anybody else does, the poor do. I think that, that is the, the other one in terms of breaking the cycle while we're staying on taxes is we, more than any other country, use property taxes to pay for local education. So the rich get funded, Better, better funded schools, and so the cycle continues. I, I, if I could just pick up on that, I, uh, I was told by one board member a long time ago, my, my board member, that in fact, we get, those of us who own houses, get a bigger tax break than anybody because of the mortgage deduction. Um, and I think if you can convince people of that or remind people of that, it's not as if those of us who own houses and are prosperous aren't supported by the government or, or don't need the government. We all do. So we're not uh, a class apart. We all need the same support. So your, your point here, Philip, is that, is that so often these, these debates are really not about equity at all or income redistribution or any of that. It's really about, uh, and I hate, to, I hate to use the vernacular, uh, but uh, whose snout is in the trough, right? I mean, if if the people who are wealthy are tilting things so that so that they actually get the greatest benefit, then and, and I think I think it's a racial equity issue for sure. Mm-hmm. And I, I housing up, and I'm sure your other organizations are aware of that and working hard. But I, I think that's the more fundamental underlying uh, challenge. We're going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our, end of our time. I just wanted to uh, note, we just finished another poll, really, really interesting results. Uh, the question was, the need for affordable housing is immense. How should America address that need? And, and the re- response was really interesting. Um, uh, 78% said cities must supply more affordable housing. Um, and then that was followed uh, by uh, stipends to landlords for providing housing to low-income tenants, right? So you've got both the supply and the demand uh, side being addressed. You have a combination of, of a private response and also um, a uh, government-led uh, led funding. Maria, how do you see long-term uh, trying to, uh, to solve this issue? Well, I think um, for us, it's really, it's going to take everyone kind of coming together to determine what happens next, right? It's going to take our government partners, it's going to take our town partners, as well as just our state government. I love the fact that someone brought up the landlords. That's a big piece of this. Um, Families in transition, for example, is not going to be able to build the number of units needed in in the amount of time needed. So landlords need to be interested, willing, and open to at least having the conversation of accepting a voucher, of working with us and other organizations who can help stabilize the people that we work with. That's a critical piece of this work. Um, It is going to be a, a long time till New Hampshire gets out of or feels like we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, 13,000 units for us is a lot of units to build throughout the state. And that's going to take some time. I think that that the points that you're all making are so important that really it's an all in kind of a problem that we we all need to consider. There is no correct answer uh, to this. There is a problem. It affects us all. It doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest of the wealthy or the poorest of the poor in that we are all part of this country and homelessness and this type of level of homelessness 
um, throughout our communities, whether it's in New Hampshire or Florida or in uh, our nation's capital, it, it really is a drag on uh, American civil society that we need to resolve. Philip Hecht, President and CEO of Housing Up in DC. Um, Maria Devlin, President and CEO of Families in Transition in New Hampshire. And Rob Cramp, Executive Director of Housing for Homeless in Florida. Thank you so much. Thank your staff, thank your boards, thank your funders for your great work. And, and that's the nonprofit report. Uh, we're going to take a two week hiatus and we'll be back to be talking about uh, performing arts organizations emerging from the pandemic. And then we'll also be uh, planning a show on uh, teaching history in the United States, another uh, topic that is uh, fraught with debate. Uh, thank you all for helping us understand the issues of homelessness and affordable housing in the United States. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.